The farmer by this time was convinced I must be a rational creature. He spoke often to me, but the sound of his voice pierced my ears like that of a watermill. Yet his words were articulate enough. I answered as loud as I could in several languages, and he often laid his ear within two yards of me, but all in vain, for we were wholly unintelligible to each other. He then sent his servants to their work, and taking his handkerchief out of his pocket, he doubled and spread it out on his hand, which he placed flat on the ground with the palm upwards, making me a sign to step into it so I could easily do, for it was not above a foot in thickness. I thought it was part to, my part to obey, and for fear of falling, I laid myself as at full length upon the handkerchief, with the remainder of which he lapped me up to the head for further security, and in this manner carried me home to his house. Gulliver lives with the family and the, the farmer and his family and grows especially close to the farmer's daughter, Glum, Glumdoclitch. After a number of adventures in the farmer's house, including an attack on Gulliver by two ferocious rats, he is taken to the metropolis where he is purchased from the farmer by the queen of Brobdingnag who presents him to the king. Glumdeglitch remains with Gulliver at the royal court as his nurse and instructor. Gulliver becomes a favorite of the king and queen. It is the custom that every Wednesday, which as I have before observed was their Sabbath, the king and queen with the royal issue of both sexes dine together in the apartment of his majesty, to whom I was now become a favorite. At these times, and at these times, my little chair and table were placed on his left hand before one of the salt cellars. This prince took a pleasure in conversing with me, inquiring into the manners, religion, laws, government, and learning of Europe, wherein I gave him the best account I could. His apprehension was so clear and his judgment so exact that he made very wise reflections and observations upon all I said. But I convinced that after I had been a little too copious in talking of my own beloved country, of our trade and wars by sea and land, of our schisms and religion and parties in the state, the prejudices of his education prevailed so far that he could not forbear taking me up in his right hand and stroking me gently with the other. After a hearty fit of laughing, asking me whether I were a Whig or a Tory, then turning to his first minister who waited behind him with a white staff, Near as tall as the man, main mast of the royal sovereign, he observed how contemptible a thing was humor. A thing was human grandeur, which could be mimicked by such diminutive insects as I. And yet, said he, I dare engage these creatures have their titles and distinctions of honor. They contrive little nests and burrows that they call houses and cities. They make a figure in the dress, in dress and equipage. They love, they fight, they dispute, they cheat, they betray. And thus he continued on while my color came and went several times with indignation to hear our noble country, the mistress of arts and arms, the scourge, scourge of France, the arbitress of Europe, the seat of virtue, piety, honor, and truth, the pride and envy of the world, so contemptuously treated. But as I was not in the condition to resent injuries, to resent injuries so upon mature thoughts, I began to doubt whether I was injured or so, or no, for after having been acute, accustomed several months to the sight and converse of these people and observed every object, object upon which I cast my eyes to be of proportionable magnitude, the horror I had first conceived from their bulk and aspect was so far worn off that I had then beheld a company of English lords and ladies in their finery and birthday clothes, according to acting their several parts in the most courtly manner of strutting and bowing and, par and pratting. To say the truth, I should have been strongly tempted to laugh at as much at them as the king and his grandees did at me. Neither did they, did, could I be forbear smiling at myself when the queen used to place me upon her white hand towards a look looking glass by which both persons appeared before me in a full view together and there could be nothing more ridiculous than the comparison, so that I really began to imagine myself dwindling many degrees below my actual size. I was frequently rallied by the queen upon account of my fearfulness. She used to ask me whether the people of my country were as great cowards as myself. The occasion was this. The king so much, is so much pestered with flies in the summer, and these odious creatures, each of them as big as Glendalbeck, Glen Dun stable lark hardly gave me any rest while I sat at dinner. 
with their continual humming and buzzing about my ears. They would sometimes alight my, upon my vitzel and leave their loathsome excrement or spawn behind, which to me was very visible, and although not to the natives of the country whose large objects were not so acute as mine in viewing smaller objects, sometimes they would fix upon my nose or forehead, where they sang to me in the quiet, smelling very offensively, and I could easily trace the vicious, viscous matter which our naturalists tell us enabled those creatures to walk with their feet upon a ceiling. I had much ado to defend myself against these detestable animals and could not bear starting where when they came on my face. It was the common practice of the dwarf to catch a number of insects in his hands, as schoolboys do among us, and let them out suddenly under my nose on purpose to frighten me and divert the queen. My remedy was to cut them in pieces with my knife as they flew in the air, wherein my dexterity was much admired.